but anyway, uh, um, so memory retention. And what we're, I'm really, the reason why I'm talking about this is for taking the CPA exam. Uh, it's not just an arbitrary <laughs> hobby of mine. So we're talking about memory retention. Then we'll start it on the Chapter 7 handout. Probably won't finish that. Uh, sampling practice exam, probably won't finish that either. We'll see. Um, the practice exam, maybe we'll finish. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what it comes up. But anyway, uh, the first one is memory retention take the CPA. All right. Um, so why am I interested in this stuff? I'm really not. You know, but <clears throat> excuse me. When I was, um, I've taught CPA review courses, and you have to learn a huge amount of information. You get a huge amount of information in a very short period of time. You, you stay for the CPA exam. Any given section, you study about six weeks, maybe up to eight weeks, but nothing more than that. You have to really cram a huge amount of information in, in a very short period of time and remember it when you go in to take the exam. So that's my only reason for really wanting to, to look into how memory works, but it was actually very interesting and, and kind of eye-opening as far as how you can actually, um, if, if you understand how memory works, how you can use that to take the CPA exam. And, and that's really what the whole, my whole point in telling you this. Although what I'm, what we're going to go over, it can, it can be used anywhere. Um, in this class, it's for uh, taking the CPA exam, but it could be for any class or any. Okay, so I sent this out. Actually, I sent it out second. I think there's a second um, I sent out. I, I don't think it's in Blackboard yet. <clears throat> okay, the first thing you got to understand about the brain is it's very important to forget, and you you forget ninety nine point nine percent of the stuff that goes into your brain. Oops. Uh, so the importance of forgetting is is just part of the brain. The brain takes in. You know, if you talk about it in terms of a computer, billions of bits of you know every every second. Um, our our eyes are way better, way higher resolution than cameras are going to be, and you know we don't we're not limited by frames per minute and all that kind of stuff. So the amount of information that goes into your brain is massive. Your brain can't deal with all of it. And even though you think you're seeing everything in the room, you're really not. Um, if you if you're out walking, you know you, you walk to your car, something you know, ten cars go by. Every one of those cars has a color, but you don't. Your, your brain says even you know doesn't even t doesn't even let you know. But your brain just says, okay, the car colors don't matter. Forget it. And you may even forget that the cars even went by. Um, you know, do any cars like no? Because you know, your brain said, "Look, you don't need this. This doesn't matter." So you forget massive amounts of information. Um, it, 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 and, and again, it happens in uh, hundreds, if not millions, of a second. Um, that they, your brain says, "Not necessary. Forget it." So the question is, well, okay. So your brain's set up to completely ignore 99% of what goes into it. So how do you have it remember things that you want it to remember? Right? I mean, you know, it, it's set up to forget. But how do you get it to remember those things that you would like it to remember? And so that's really what we're talking about here when we go through this stuff. Okay. Now, one of the things is, you always hear about how um, learning isn't passive, but you need to actively stimulate something to make your brain remember it. It's not just going to happen naturally. It happened here. Okay. Um, 
this gets a little bit into the mechanics of it, a, a synapse, synaptic plasticity, you can look into that. Um, but basically, you're building up these kind of pathways in the brain. And these pathways in the brain are their connections. You know, there's connections in the brain. And, and the more you use those, the more they um, get strengthened. And there's different ways you can strengthen them. Um, but the neat, kind of neat thing is it doesn't matter what, uh, what you use to strengthen those. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. But it could be anything. You know, it, it, it could be that, you know, if, uh, if I'm studying accounts payable and there's something important and I look at this car at the same time, this car goes in, it's associated with accounts payable. Me looking at this car, I say, oh, accounts payable. So it's just, it, there's a, even though this car has nothing to do with what I'm studying, it becomes part of those and it'll actually help and build up. You know, Remembering that this car I was looking at when I was studying accounts payable will actually increase those um, pathways, strengthen those pathways in your brain. Okay, so anything, the strength of the synapse will have a deep understanding of the object. So it could, it could be anything. Okay. <clears throat> uh, taking notes by hand. I know some of you guys already do this, so this is not anything. I, I do stuff on the computer because it's legible. But um, generally speaking, you know, taking notes by hand is a, a better way of getting it into long-term memory than actually typing. And if you think about writing something, you know, I see the letter S. Okay, I, I know on the, on the keyboard I could just press the letter S and it would put in a letter S in. There wouldn't be a lot, there wouldn't be as much um, memory for that. But to make the letter S, you have to think about the letter S, you know, you control your muscles. A tremendous amount of brain power goes into controlling your muscles. So controlling the muscles to make the letter S, you have to feel, you know, the pen or pencil and how much pressure you put on and all that kind of stuff. Tremendous amount of brain power goes into writing. It's, 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 it's difficult. Uh, you know, probably one of the reasons why you know, humans didn't write for so many years or whatever, you know, because it was difficult to do, difficult to control, um, all that stuff. So anyway, writing is a very good way of strengthening it because it takes a whole lot of memory. And again, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily connected to whatever you're studying. If you're saying accounts payable, writing the letter S is not necessarily connected to that, but the act will strengthen it. So writing things out is a, is a good way to put it into long-term memory. All right, uh, reading notes out loud, uh, even by yourself or discussing it with classmates. Discussing with classmates is, is a, probably a better way to do it, but um, reading notes out loud and discussing them, it takes a long time to learn how to speak. It takes a lot of brain power to control your voice and your tongue and your mouth and all this stuff to learn how to speak. You know, you, if, I'm sure you, little kids, you see them, they get, you know, it takes them years to, <laughs> to be able to say something that you can actually understand. So it takes a huge amount of brain power to do that. So even the speaking by yourself, you, you know, you, you might sound like you're crazy or something, but if you're just talking about accounts payable, accounts payable are, you know, uh, non-interest bearing, uh, whatever they do, uh, you know, within normal trade transact, whatever you're studying for the CPA exam, if you say it out loud, even to yourself, it increases that memory. So it's, it's you know, it, it's a really good way of putting it into long-term memory. Speaking, of, speaking with somebody else adds it up even another level because you're going to be responding, which is a high level, um, uses a lot of brain power to what they're saying. So saying it to somebody else, getting a study partner and saying things back and forth is a really good way um, to also do it again because speaking takes a lot of brain power putting it in there so even though it might sound odd saying it out loud is a good way all right uh repetition and this is what we kind of think of we say memorize something you write something 30 times or whatever this is good it, it, and it will definitely strengthen it and it's important if you do this to do it 
usually within 15, 30 sec 15 to 30 seconds of, um, of when you learn it. Another, another kind of funny thing about memory, you know, you think about long-term memory, except when I did, I would think about weeks or years or something like that, or months in the case of CPA exam. When people studying this talk about long-term memory, they talk about seconds, like 15 seconds is long-term. If it doesn't go in in 15 seconds, it's not ever going in, um, or you know, 30, whatever it is. But short-term memory and long-term memory, long-term memory is seconds. Um, so when you're talking about reinforcing something, it isn't, oh, I'll say it once every day for the next three weeks. Um, you generally have to do it you know, fairly quickly within the time of learning it. Okay. Uh, memory triggers, some of these are ones you guys have seen before, guided readings, you fill in the blank stuff. Those have been around for 100 years, probably more, <laughs> a couple hundred years. Flashcards, you get in a couple hundred years. You probably, uh... This is the one that is pretty interesting to me. Color-coded writing. Um, color-coded writing, this is, this is something, this is something unique to humans, by the way, almost, you know, or mammals, almost all mammals see in black and white. They, they don't need to see in color. Um, humans see color. We see color, at least a, a range of color. Uh, and it takes a huge amount of brain power to do it, which is why most animals don't do it. They don't need it. My dogs, you know, they, 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 they bark at squirrels. They don't need to know what color the squirrel is. They just know to bark at the squirrel. I don't know what they know. But anyway, um, humans can see colors. It takes a huge amount of brain power. Writing things, highlighting things, writing things in different colors, using different color pens when you're writing, those all go into strengthening your understanding of it. It sounds very odd. It's very simple and, and you don't notice it's happening. It's not like you say, oh gee, this is the color orange. This is much more difficult for my brain to process than the color white or black or gray even. Um, but the color orange is hard for your brain to see and to understand. Um, and, it's, and it's a learned thing too. So when you have these uh, colors added in, it actually strengthens it without, without you really even knowing it. It strengthens it. Um, I, I worked with a, guy, with a colleague who was very meticulous and all this stuff, and he highlighted everything. I mean, you get a book from him, every single page is highlighted. And I remember, you know, I had to borrow a book for a class with him. And I, and I said, is there any, is there a code of this or anything? He said, no, no. He said, if I highlight it, though, I remember it. He didn't, I, I don't think he knew anything about what I'm telling you, but it makes sense that um you know if you highlight it and never it, it adds to the difficulty for your brain it develops those strengthening so colors highlighting things in color actually increases the um your memory of something again it doesn't have to be necessarily related to accounts payable if you highlight it write it in different colors and color markers and all that kind of stuff um it actually increases your memory of it uh, mnemonic devices, you guys didn't know what those are. They're just kind of saying things that rhyme or acronyms or that kind of stuff. Uh, write it down from memory is once, once you do get stuff in memory, if writing it down from memory is one of the best ways because it actually uh, involves recalling and then also writing, which very much strengthens it. So if there's a topic that you can remember and write out, that's a huge strengthening thing because not only do you have, you know, the, the ability to, to bring it up in your mind, at least at that point, but also to write it out. And, so, and, and we all have done this before. You read something and you go to write, you forgot what you read. Or you go back and look at it because you really don't understand it. You know, it's, it's not going in long. So if you can get it to get in long term and put it in there, and, and actually the more times you go back, it's going to strengthen that synapse stuff. And it's going to, you know. So writing it out from memory is a huge way to um, remember stuff. Rewriting your notes. You know, people that are, are you know A students, what they do? They, a lot of times they rewrite their notes. Okay, 
Uh, and one of the odd ones, besides the color thing, is this one. For whatever reason, all the studies come up with it, and that is uh, reading and writing stuff, doing your studying uh, just before sleep actually puts it into longer term memory. Generally speaking, it'll go into longer term memory. So doing things before you sleep, um, you know, within a few minutes, you know, 15, 20 minutes of going to bed, it uh, goes into longer term memory. You say, well, okay, that's <laughs> that's not very helpful necessarily because I go to bed once again. Well, here's the thing, though. If you are studying for something that's very big, like the CPA exam, um, leading up to it, if you take naps, you know, you uh, study for something, if you can fall asleep for an hour even, you know, set an alarm, wake up, study a little more, go back to sleep, you know, if, the more naps you can you take into the day, you can actually put things into longer term memory, and it actually is a method of putting it. So anyway, the whole, um, you know, the whole point of this is, is for us as the CPA exam, it, it, you can use it in any class, I mean, there's, it's not like we're the only ones on the planet, but this, um, this is one of those things that it, it is a way of putting things into long term memory. And especially for things like the CPA exam, where you have a huge amount of information you got to study in a relatively short period of time, and you have to overcome your brain's need to forget stuff. All right, uh, any questions on that? Okay. Well, let's go to the chapter seven handout, internal control. And this is one of the most misunderstood areas of auditing, no, just, in, I mean, just accounting in general is internal controls. It's not just for auditing, but um, other things too. Hey, look, I'm gonna make it a different color. In general, kind of, see, we're memorizing it more right now. Okay, so by the way, I sent out a new chapter seven handout. So if yours looks different, if yours has a bunch of arrows in it, um, that is the original one I sent out. I sent out one without the arrows because I kind of want to walk through it. All right, so <clears throat> internal controls. And we've talked about segregation of duties. This is a very important aspect of it. Custody of the asset, authorization, record keeping, car. You remember my car? You know, I had a mnemonic. Uh, car. Uh, so this is what we're talking about, is basically keeping these things um, separate. Okay, so rather than going through a bunch of definitions about internal control, what I'd like to start out is just going through some internal controls, just so we get an idea, kind of a feel for it, of what happens. You kind of like, you know, if you ever see little kids playing t-ball or something like that, the coaches, like the first day they just have them run around the bases in the correct order <laughs> so you, you know you get hitting the ball and then running to the pitcher mound or something or running home or whatever um you know they just have them run around the bases get used to running around the bases the little you know these little four-year-old kids they don't know why they're running around the bases but they just have them doing it so that's kind of what we're going to do here we're going to run around the bases we're going to take a look at internal controls over purchasing and um yeah and, and it just kind of give you an idea Okay, so you need something in the company. The company needs uh, whatever it is. So operation needs paint for the furniture. Apparently, this is a furniture company. So the furniture, uh, the paint uh, operation department, whoever doing the painting, will fill out a requisition request and send that to. Purchasing, which will create a purchase order. Sometimes it's a purchase order is started in the operations and then fulfilled. However, they do the documentation. But basically, there's a request and then it goes through purchasing. Okay. So let's stop here for a second. Um, why don't? Why doesn't the operations just? call up who's ever the you know the vendor the seller of paint and order the paint why don't we just have the operations do it why do we have it go through purchasing
you know, they, you know, these people aren't helpless. They can they can make a call to a vendor and say, hey, send over, uh, you know, 500 gallons of blue paint or whatever it is. So why don't we do that? And by the way, uh, managers will say, you know, will actually say, well, why don't we just have, you know, and they're not being bad. It's just they don't understand why. So why don't we have the operations people call up and buy the pay? Anyone? No one? You can put it in chat if you want. But why 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 don't we just have people who need it in the department, you know, the paint department, whatever, call up and say, Hey, Joe's paint supplies, why don't you send over some paint? I mean they could. But why don't we do that? Any ideas? Well, for one thing, the paint when the paint department says, you know what we really we actually don't need paint, we need a Ferrari. Wouldn't it be fun to have a Ferrari drive around? You know, let's order a Ferrari. So you cannot have people in the company who are not designated as buying something uh, simply order things. And there will be certain things they can order and certain things they can't. And my guess is that Ferrari is not on the list of things they can buy. So uh, you'll have a, a purchasing department. In the purchasing department, there are professionals that are there to find ways to buy things you know they'll find things that are appropriate for the company uh get bids from cut from uh, people selling the stuff get the best price which in operations they may not do that um but they'll call around get the best price for something usually they take three bids it depends on what they're looking at uh they'll get bids on on uh, and they'll work out uh prices and shipping times and all the stuff that goes into getting the paint uh, to into the company. So the purchasing department is there, first of all, as a way of limiting what people can order, only ordering things that are allowed by the company. And then also doing kind of the legwork of actually finding the best way to get it, you know, the best supplier who can get it there on time at a certain price and that sort of thing. So there's an efficiency part to it, but there's also a control part in that you just can't have people ordering anything on the company for the company. So once they find a vendor, they'll send the purchase order to the vendor. So they made up, make up this purchase order. It'll have the price and quantity and all that stuff will be on there. Uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me put that in here somewhere. So this will have the price and quantity. Yeah. So that'll be on the purchase order. It'll get sent to an outside vendor. And this outside vendor will uh, ship the paint. So the paint will get shipped. Let's see here. Let's see here. We can just have shape. Maybe there's, there's probably a way to do it. Like you have a favorites with shapes up here. So they will ship the paint to the company. It will head into the receiving department and they will take a look at it and they'll compare it. They will, they'll say, okay, you know, this is what we received. And the receiving report is basically a purchase order with the quantity blanked out. And the reason you do that is because you want them to count it. So they'll count it. The receiving department will recount, uh, count it up and they'll say how many, how much paint was sent. And they'll make a receiving report. All right, so ordered the paint, uh, purchase order created, sent to an outside vendor, they sent the paint, we received it in the receiving department. And we make a receiving report, this report will say exactly what we received. Now, 
Accounts payable. Accounts payable, before they pay it, they're going to match all of these up. So accounts payable is going to get um, a copy of the purchase order. The outside vendor is going to send in the wrong spot here. The outside vendor is going to send their invoice you know, with the dollar amounts. And then again, these should match up to the purchase order. The invoice amounts, you know, for price and quantity should be the same as on the invoice. And if they're not, they got to figure it out why it's not. And also, we're going to make sure that we've actually received the item that they are that was ordered and that they're billing us for. So all those will go into accounts payable and they'll match them up before it's paid. They'll match up uh, these three documents. They'll match up uh, before they are it's paid. And while the quantity on the purchase order might not be what's invoiced, uh, the quantity will be verified by this receiving report. When I say, when I say that is, you know, maybe they ordered 600 gallons of paint and they got 500 gallons of paint. They're only going to pay for 500 gallons of paint. So the purchase order, you know, you'll see, you'll see sometimes in books they'll have it written that the, um, the receiving report should match the purchase order. That's, that's not the case, and oftentimes it's not, it doesn't happen. Um, because there'll be people that'll be out of something, um, different quantities will be sent. You know, they order 600 gallons of paint. The company only sells them in, you know, containers of a thousand or whatever. And I mean, you know, so they'll send a thousand and they'll have to work it out with purchasing and all that. So, anyway, there's a lot of times that you'll see almost if there's a big order, especially a number of items, almost always there's going to be some kind of shortage and that sort of thing. So, but the receiving department, the quantity in the receiving department receives and the price from the purchasing department should match. So it should match the invoice. So if they ordered 600 and they only sent 500 gallons of paint, the invoice should be for 500 gallons of paint and it should be for the price that was on the purchase order. And if it's not, it gets kicked out and purchasing has to go and talk to the vendor and see what's going on with it and have them cut a new invoice so that it does match so that they can get paid. So this is a control over, now this is a control over inventory coming in, but it's also, you know, uh, uh, a control over cash. You don't want, accounts payable is a way to get money out of the place, right? Accounts payable, they, they get, you know, if you can get an accounts payable with a company, that means they're going to pay you, you know, so that's a way to get money out of a company. So it's also a control over cash, this, this uh, same scenario. All right, so, and in the end, you know, this paint that's received, that is, uh, goes through the receiving department, the receiving department has no need for paint. So what they will do is send the paint to the department that requested it, and that will kind of end the cycle, and they'll get paid once they, all these things get matched up. Any questions on that? So these are all controls, you know, it's control over what gets ordered. It gets controls over the price and quantities and stuff that are ordered. Um, it's uh, control over what's received. Um, and what eventually get, what, what gets paid for. So these are all uh, controls over that, over that cycle. And by the way, you know, if any one of these is missing, obviously it doesn't get paid. If there's a receiving report and invoice, it may be for something that we didn't order. Sometimes people will send invoices to companies saying that they need a payment, even though the company never did anything. And, you know, they might send out 500 of these and one company might pay it. Knowing that they, you know, so you find a company that has weak internal controls. You send them an invoice, they'll pay it. 
now you can do it again you know if you get money out of the place so you have to have a purchase order make sure that you order it. you don't want the vendor just sending you things you didn't order um matched up to the you know the quantities will be in the receiving report if there's no receiving report and they send an invoice that doesn't get paid you say well we never received it yeah so um you know and you can ask them for a proof of delivery or a well proof of delivery in this case would probably be the way they want but uh things that were never delivered you know if someone sends an invoice then you don't have to pay it so that these are just controls though over the business and it's basically to get you know the business's objectives of buying what you only what you need buying it at the price that you agree on and only paying for what was sent to you so these are controls over purchasing Any question on that and by the way if you're doing auditing one of the things we're doing auditing um uh, a few different things. If you have uh, in vendor invoices that aren't matched to purchase orders or receiving reports, uh, those you know you flag those, make sure that those were not paid. But you also might look at receiving reports. It's possible you have a receiving report for something that is not on the books. And notice if there's a receiving report, there should be an accounts payable. What a company might be doing if they wanted to of the books is to not record an accounts payable right and if they if they so if they receive something so one of the things you you check for at the end of the you know, at the end of the period is our receiving reports that were made prior to year end you know up through december 31st or whatever and you'll check those receiving reports and say okay here's a receiving report for whatever um this should be there should be an accounts payable set up for this because we received it um and you know, checking to make sure it was there's a purchase order for it but anything that was received should have an accounts payable a company may not want to, to put it on the books because they don't want the accounts payable on the books so one of the things you always look for is those are those receiving reports you can look at other shipping documents too but receiving reports are the ones that show an account and all that to it Okay, so let's go over incompatible duties. <clears throat> Amy is the accounts receivable clerk. No problem so far. Okay, uh, man room delivers customers' checks to Amy every month. Amy applies the checks received to customers' accounts. The checks are given to a cashier for depositing. Which incompatible duties does Amy have, if any? Anyone? Oh, come on. What? Uh, yes, she does have A, and by the way, she should not have A, but she does have A. So Amy has, let me make these yellow. But Amy also has, oh, no way, oh, okay, that's fine. I was in a meeting recently, it was like a big meeting that had tons of people in it, and everyone kept talking, and he was a, so finally the, the, the person running it just said, okay, put everything in the chat. It was so much easier, it's like, oh yeah, this is it, you know, because then you can respond to, what, and you respond in the chat, it was like, well, we've been doing this all along. Everyone's so keen on talking. But anyway, so here's the uh, incompatible duties. Notice what Amy could do. And I don't know Amy, but uh, if Amy wanted to, Amy could possibly set up another bank account with a similar name to what the company is. Deposit these checks that she's receiving. She should never get her hands on the checks. This is the problem. If you if you want to know this this is the problem of this problem of the thing here. Besides my spacing problem.
This one's a big no-no. Uh, Amy should never get her hands on the checks because Amy is record keeping. So record keeping is fine. This is uh, this is good. Uh, she's the accounts receivable clerk. She should be keeping the records. She should get a list of the checks that are given, but she should never receive the checks themselves. So Amy's a receivable clerk. Her job is record keeping, but she should she should not get the checks. She should get a listing of the checks, and she can apply them to the accounts, but she should never get the checks themselves. The checks should be given directly to the cashier. Uh, if you guys take accounting, actually, we'll, we'll go through some of this, the, the things like that. Uh, accounting uh, 433 in the graduate program. I think you maybe you'll even take that as an undergrad. I'm not positive. Um, uh, if you need a professor's uh, signature, let me know. I can give that. But anyway, um, yeah, the uh, uh, so accounting 433 is the advanced accounting. We actually go through the how you test different accounts. One of them is cash, obviously. Okay, Bill is a customer service manager. Bill goes through all the return merchandise items and determines if any of them can be resold. Bill adds items that can be resold into inventory and the items are sent to the sales floor. I think it's a comma there, doesn't it? Um, Bill adds items that can be resold. Uh, Oh, into the inventory system and items are sent to the Okay, so yeah, so the inventory system and then they're sent to the, So Bill enters it. Okay, you know, someone returned a mop and this mop is okay. We can return it to our inventory. So he puts it into the inventory system and the items are sent to the, uh, to the sales floor. Bill enters items that cannot be sold into the system as scrapped. Unsaleable items are disposed in the garbage. Which incompatible duties does Bill have, if any? This one's actually kind of an easy one. A little bit anyway. Uh, yeah, actually, Bill has all of them. He takes a look at the items and sees what, uh, you know, whether they can be kept or not, right? He has custody of the, uh, the items. He goes through all the return merchandise. He's authorized to say it's okay to put back on the floor or uh, they'll be scrapped. And he actually puts it right into the system. So Bill has everything. Um, so this is a, and notice what Bill could be doing. Bill could be taking the merchandise in, saying it's scrapped, putting it in his pocket and walking out with the thing, you know, whatever it was. So, uh, and, and, and be able to put it into the record keeping as being scrapped. So he has a custody of the asset, put it in his pocket, his authorization to say that it's scrapped. And then he also goes right in the system and does the bookkeeping for it and says that it's scrapped. So, you know, it should be an authorization and someone else should be able to, to put it in. And, you know, whoever has custody of it should not have the authorization to say whether it's, um, you know, the, you should put it on the floor or not. They'll simply bring it in. Someone else will do the authorization. Somebody else should be doing the record. So this is, Bill has everything. And, uh, you know, so so Bill could actually just put something in his pocket, write it off, and no one would ever find it. Why? Because it's, it shows it's in the garbage. It's thrown out. And what happened to this, Bill? It's thrown out. It's thrown out in the garbage. Um, so, 
one of the problems with these things too, we have these overlapping duties is it's very difficult to find any problems because uh, of just what, I just what we just talked about is that in the system, it'll look like it was scrapped. And if it's scrapped, it was in the garbage and it's gone. So, you know, it isn't like there's this big paper trail saying Bill took it. Um, it's the, there's no paper trail, the paper trail that says it was thrown out and it's in the system is being thrown out and probably no one's looking for it because it is thrown out. Uh, even though maybe someone turned a perfectly good TV or whatever, um, you know, that it just disappears. But there's also, I mean, some people in management will say, well, you know, why, why do you distrust your employees so much? And it's a terrible idea that you guys don't trust your employees. The fact of the matter is that you are giving that, people aren't stupid. Someone, you know, Bill, if Bill's in that job, it probably would take him a day or two to realize I can put the stuff in my pocket and no one would ever know. I mean, you know, assuming Bill's not a knucklehead, you could do that. So one of the things about having good internal controls is it doesn't tempt the employees to do something they would normally do. <clears throat> if Bill knew that there's no way, you know, maybe he authorizes whether it goes on the floor or back, but if he knew that there was no way that he doesn't keep the item, you know, if it's going to get thrown in the garbage, he, you know, gives it over to the whoever's supposed to dispose of it in the garbage, and it's written off that okay, this is was it disposed of, and blah blah blah. And same thing with you know going to the floor, go to the floor, somebody else checks it off, and then that goes back in the inventory. Whoever puts it on the floor, they you know it gets notarized to whoever puts it back in the inventory that it's on the floor. That is, if that was happening, Bill wouldn't be tempted. I'm not saying build anything, but the idea is you're tempting people to do something and people aren't stupid, you know, and, and never think that, oh, this person drops out of school in, uh, you know, 10th grade or whatever. Geniuses drop out of school in 10th grade. Okay. Uh, Kathy works in Treasury Department. Kathy creates the payroll checks every month and mails them to the employees. Kathy does the bank reconciliation and payroll for payroll every month and sends it to accounting. Which incompatible duties does Kathy have? Okay, Treasury Department, they handle the cash. So Treasury Department, just in general, uh, handling the cash, they are, they're supposed to handle the cash. Oops, that's not how you spell cash. I was testing you guys, and that's not how you do it. Okay. So Kathy uh, creates the payroll checks and mails them to the employees. So far, that's Kathy's job, and I'm going to give you this one. Uh, this is custody of assets, cash. Treasury Department does have custody of the assets, so this is good. Uh, she's supposed to have that. She's in the Treasury Department. They deal in the cash. They write the checks and they send them out to people. Kathy does a bank reconciliation for payroll account every month and sends it to accounting. Okay, this is the one we got to talk about. This actually is an incompatible duty. Which one is it? Uh, what does accounting do? In accounting, we do record keeping. So this is the problem. The reconciliation will, will trigger journal entries. Kathy should not be doing it because Kathy, the bank reconciliation that gets sent to record keeping, this will be journal entries. This is actually bad. So Kathy should not be doing the bank reconciliation. The accounting department should. This is an accounting duty.
So custody the asset. She's in treasury. That's her job. Need checks, but doing the bank reconciliation in notice of bank reconciliation. Uh, you know, she could send a check to herself and make it show up on the bank reconciliation as a um, you know whatever you know uh, that it was paid to whoever or whatever you know. Um, she could she could manipulate that bank reconciliation to show that you know it's um, make that money disappear. And once accounting makes the journal entries that she has on there, then you know you you it becomes very difficult to find because now you have records that match what happened, even though the transactions don't match up. So it's very difficult. Um, segregation of duties is very difficult. Now, from a management point of view, a manager may take a look at it and say, well. Kathy does the payroll. She should do the reconciliation. You didn't have accounting trying to figure out what she did. You know, she's the most uh, knowledgeable about it. She should be doing the bank reconciliation for this. You can't do that because that's that's again it's incompatible duties. It's not saying that she would, but she could manipulate that bank reconciliation to make the money that she take she took disappear. You know, show up as a non SF check or whatever she's going to do with it to um, you know. To offset what she's taken, uh, that's the problem. So, bank reconciliation should be done by accounting and accounting only, and that's because bank because journal entries come out of it. Again, this stuff you know it can be difficult to kind of think about things. Okay, uh, Dan is the accounts receivable clerk. Dan applies payments on the the payments on the checklist to the customer's accounts. Okay, that seems okay. So this is what Dan should be doing. And writes off any uncollectible accounts. Which incompatible duties does Dan have, if any? Okay, I'll give you the one that Dan has that he should have, and that is the record keeping. What's the other one? He actually does have one more incompatible duty. What is it? Now, he doesn't actually receive the checks. He gets that on a checklist, which is what you're supposed to get. He's, uh, You'll get a checklist. And um, yeah, the part of the customer account, so this uh, is okay. What other incompatible duty does Dan have? This one's good. We'll say good for this one. What incompatible duty? So record keeping, that's Dan's job. He's a receivable clerk. He should be doing record keeping. He doesn't get the checks. He gets the checklist. So he's not actually receiving the checks from the people. What other incompatible duty does he have? You can put it in chat if you want. Anyone? Well, oh, come on. There's only two, A or B, flip a coin. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are still here or not. Okay, I'll put it in. Uh, authorizations. This is bad. He should not be 
uh, authorizing the write-offs. You know, Dan could work it out with a vendor that he writes off their account and they split it. So the customer owes $500, he writes off the account, the customer pays him $250. So now, I'm not saying that Dan's doing this, but this is one of those things that, again, is there's our incompatible duties. And notice that if Dan is authorized and it goes into the record game, it's very going to be very difficult to find this. We say, where's this money? Well, it was written off. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go through this part first. So this is kind of a definition-y kind of thing. Okay, what is internal control? Policies and procedures. Very important. So policies and procedures. Is that the management objective leading to operations? Reporting. And compliance. You'll notice that those are our three audits. Operational audit, financial reporting audit, compliance audits. Okay, uh, audit is responsibility for internal control. The financial audit. There's going to be two different types of audits. There's going to be internal control audit and a financial audit. Financial audit, everybody gets, issuers and non-issuers. Oops. Do that again. So issuers and non-issuers both get financial audits. This is the audit we've been talking about. This is one we, we think about most when we talk about audits. The few of the financial statements are um, free of material misstatements. When it comes to internal controls, and we've talked about this too, you evaluate the internal controls for financial statements, you do it throughout the entire year. So what I mean by that is, if there was an internal control problem in March that maybe they corrected, you know, within a week or two or whatever. So they find this internal control, internal control problem, they fix it, come year end. Notice that any transactions in that time where there was an internal control problem, there could be a problem with those transactions because there was some kind of control lapse in, in that period of time. So when you do the internal control, you, you're looking at the internal controls for the company, um, you're you're looking at those through the entire year and if there was any internal control problems in the entire year it's significant there are significant anyways uh those get reported on even if they've been corrected so okay we found this in march we corrected it you know whatever um it doesn't matter if, it, if there's an internal control problem in any part of the year because financial transactions happen during that period of time uh, it's a problem. And you can't jump in the time machine, go back and make it, you know, put those controls in so that the March transactions are okay. At the end of the year, you know, the history is written. Uh, and if there's an internal control problem, that's part of the history is that there's an internal control problem. Okay, so that is for a financial audit. We look at the entire year. Internal control audits. 
Uh, you don't have to be a publicly traded company to get an internal control audit, but you are required to get an internal control audit if you are an issuer. So if you are an issuer, you're required to get it. You're required to have an internal control audit. Now, here's the weird thing about it. Evaluation of the effectiveness of internal controls as of fiscal year end. So this, these are the are the controls that are that need to be, you know, that need working on if they're significant. Only those that are still around at the end of the year. If they've been fixed, you don't put them in the internal control audit. It's future oriented. So financial audits are historical. How much in sales did we have last year? How much, you know, revenue, blah, 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 I mean, you know, costs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and those are affected by the internal controls at the time. The audit on internal controls is future oriented. Okay, going into the future, what problems do we have with internal controls? So it's future oriented. If they've already corrected the internal control, it doesn't go into the, into the internal control audit. So the internal control audit is future oriented in that at year end, what are the controls going into the future? What are they? And what needs to be addressed, you know, going into the future and so on and so forth. And what will happen oftentimes if they do find a problem, the company will fix a problem. We fix that problem, you know, by January 10th, but that problem was gone or whatever. Going to the next year, you know, that it will be that that control has been fixed and it won't appear in the next year's audit because it's not the control problem anymore. And that's what they want. You know, they want any control problems that you find to be fixed, you know, as soon as possible and, you know, the next year. And if they're not fixed, they go back in the report. So if, they're, if the same control problem exists, you know, and the client may say, well, you already reported on that last year. Said, yeah, well, you didn't fix it. It's a year end is still not fixed. So it goes in the report again. Um, you know, uh, as long as it's not fixed, it goes in the report. Okay. So this is at year end. Uh, so this is historical. Hey, I, already, I got it in there. I didn't know I didn't put that in there. And this is future oriented. Now, uh, uh, Issuers will have to have both of these reports, uh, the financial uh, audit report and the internal control audit report. Uh, yeah, okay. A material internal control weakness was discovered by a non-issuer client on August 5th, 2022. The control weakness was eliminated on August 8th, 2022. Assuming the client has a year on December 31st, which audits would be affected by this event? Okay, which one, which audit would be affected by it? <laughs> you guys aren't here, are you? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, it, it would only be on the financial audit. For one thing, they only, they're only probably only getting a financial audit, but also, um, even if they did have a internal control audit, it was fixed before year end. Tests and controls are required for year-end financial audits of financial audits actually do not require internal controls. Test relevant control activities if they are relying on them. If they're not relying on any of those, they don't need to. For internal control audits, they are required. For financial audits, they're not only they're only required if you only if you are um, 
Only if you're relying on the controls. Okay, we'll stop here. And when we come back, we'll start in on the, uh, oops, not that, uh, the sampling practice exam. Yeah, we might be able to finish this. We probably can finish it. If we do, I'll send out the, uh, the sampling exam. Okay, so let's say be back at uh, 3, 311.
Okay, uh, sampling. Where's he saying? What's the error rate? Anyone? You still there? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll speed it up. Air rate. Can you line the controls? No. Oops. But the misstatement of purchase is unknown.
Sorry, I got a parking dog. Okay, um, they plan to have a subset of tests. These are dollar tests. Fire items. <clears throat> the right item sampled substantive test. They have to be increased. Uh, for example, I'm just making this up. Uh, 500 items, maybe you have to take 800 items now. Because you cannot rely on the internal controls. Is this such a by the AICPA? Required. Test controls are only required when the author is relying on the internal controls to reduce subset of testing. So they are not re necessarily if you don't if you're not um, if you're not going to rely on the internal controls. They're not required. And just to kind of put an end to this, uh, the um, PC AOB. This is for issuers. Uh, test of control. Are required. Internal control audits. Just say no. So AICPA. So those questions on the AICPA, the AICPA does not require it unless you're relying on the internal controls. PCAOB, if you're doing an internal control audit, you have to do test of controls. Let's go plan planning. Okay.
So this will be the average. Mean per unit. Yeah, eight thousand. For Uh, predict your misstatement. Yeah. There's 380 in the accounts receivable, so these are understated by 20,000. Ratio estimation.
And three. I think I'm going to get through this here.
Okay, calculated uh, projected risk statement would be those two together. 5200. Okay, uh, this is at 10%. Sampling interval is 5,000. Uh, reliability factor at zero is Okay, uh, incremental allowance. I only have one of them, 3.89 minus 2.31. With five eight, we only have one misstatement for the incremental allowance, which is this one. Okay, well, we can get rid of these, we don't need them. Upper limit. Nineteen thousand seventy. Hey, we're done. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, well, that's good. All right. So, let's save that. New plan. Uh, this is completed. So, the sampling exam will be sent out.
and it will be due Let's go and get rid of the sampling. We doubled it now. We do on the 19th. Okay. So sampling exam will be mailed out. All right. Very good.